Hi, thanks for checking out Next Level Carpentry. Uh, this video is episode four of the pallet wood door build project, and I'll be uh, cutting the jam to length and assembling it, and then uh, routing in and installing the hinges into the jam. And those are Sugatsuni invisible hinges, so that's not quite as straightforward as regular hinges. Um, to make these cuts, I have to make a pretty bold uh, miter cut using an Osborne EB3 miter fence. Uh, to miter the jam corners. I went through uh, SketchUp and tried to figure out how to make an interlocking door jam corner. You can see it in this screenshot from the SketchUp model. And the normal rabbited stepped um, joinery for a door jam just isn't going to be practical because I've got this uh, extended jam that accepts casing on the outside. You can see in that drawing how intricate that has to be to miter this outside piece. Uh, and then step the inside surfaces. So I just decided to miter the whole thing and to do that I've got to do a cross cut miter on the table saw. I don't have a sliding uh, compound miter box that might work for making these cuts otherwise. But when making a short cut on a long piece I want this table to be super smooth and that's why I uh, cleaned and waxed the top. There's a video link here for machine maintenance tips I did some time back to show the process of uh, getting this stuff all tuned up like that for demanding processes like this. And here's a mock-up slash prototype of the jam corners with a prototype casing. The finished casing will be uh, laminated two different colors of wood and be a little bigger and much cooler than this. But here's the jam. You can see the weather stripping slot that was done in episode three. So all that comes together nicely, but there's a complication, and that is the fact that the hinge jam is extra thick because I have to mortise in the body of this hinge into that jam. But what that means is the corner of the hinge jam isn't miter to miter. It's got to have this extra material on here. But the head jam and the strike jam will be normal. So I'll cut those first, and I'll actually cut both ends of the head jam first of all. Does anybody else use this shrink wrap tape around the shop? I don't know. I uh, really like it. It keeps parts organized. Uh, parts like these jams that could twist and um, move around a little bit. I like to clamp it together. It just seems to help things out. Uh, but anyways, I've got the head jam wrapped up with the others for a couple days here around the shop since I shot that last video segment. And I'll begin by cutting this. Naturally, I made this head jam extra long, but not a lot. So I'll cut the first miter on the good end of the piece, and then any extra trimming will get cut off the less desirable end. And because there's no truer saying in the world than you can cut them off, but you can't cut them on, I made the side jams extra long too. And I'll follow the same logic, uh, cutting the miter on the good end and then trimming off the less desirable end for final length. And the irony does not escape me in, uh, in the fact that I'm wearing a, a DeWalt BS1000 shirt with the motto, measure once, cut twice, because even if I do screw one of these up, I can run them through my board stretcher and just keep right on working. Do you know what the opposite of irony is? <laughs> Wrinkly. <laughs> and by force of habit, I lay out 45 degree cut on each end of this piece and measure the difference just to make sure I've got enough length for that 36 inch door slab. And I've got 37 and a quarter, which is great because I'm making my own door and I want to make it exactly 36 inches. I'll make the finish jam cut at 36 and 5 sixteenths. My table saw is a right tilt, so this might look backwards to a lot of you, but either way, it's making a bold 45 degree angle cut on the end of this door jam. I gave this blade a good cleanup before I made cuts on that sample jam. And there's a link here for cleaning saw blades, which is important when making cuts like this, because a cut like this tends to generate extra heat, which causes gum and pitch to build up on the blade. Smurf gloves give me a good grip on the wood. Some miter fence attachments have clamps and such, and if that's what you're used to using and it's more comfortable, that's definitely the way to go.
I could put a sacrificial board on the fence to push this piece of scrap through, but regardless, it's important to be mindful of what's going to happen to that scrap. In this particular case, I can just stand out of the way in case the saw blade gives it a flick. But there's my initial 45 degree cut. I always like to double check the squareness of the actual cut. This one is perfect, but sometimes if the piece creeps a little bit while being cut, the cut will be curved or out of square and can spoil a lot of work in a real hurry. There's nothing wrong with using a tape measure to mark a cut like this, but I like to use a flat rule when I can. And I want 36 and 5 16 from the short point of this miter right there. And that measurement gives me the short point for the miter on this end. And I square the mark over to the edge because that's where it's going to start. And it's a 45 degree cut, which will go right here. And this is one of those all or nothing cuts on a project. So I pay extra close attention to make sure the saw blade is on the right side of the pencil mark for the kerf. And then I make the cut with a steady positive feed rate. And that is going to be excellent. And this is where that well waxed table is so important. And because I already trimmed excess off the end of this jam, there's no snipe on the end of it. So I can make this miter cut very near the good end of the piece. With the miter cut near the end, the overall length is still an inch or so long. And I like it that way because when I make the all or nothing cut for length, it'll be on the square end. And that square cut is a lot less dicey to make. That cut is perfecto Monday, whatever that means. And that is going to be sweet. I've got extra length in this thick hinge jam for a built-in fudge factor too. But basically, the miter starts at the back side of this show face. So there'll be a bit of a square end on the top of this hinge jam. And I'll cut the miter accordingly. Extra thickness on this jam means I need to raise the blade even further. And that is pretty much maxed out the depth of cut capability on this unisaw at a 45 degree angle. I'm using a blade stabilizer to keep the blade running true in this bold cut. And you'll see that it causes interference with the off cut because the kerf is 3 seconds wide and the board will hit that blade stabilizer. So I make the cut in a few passes so that interference from the off cut doesn't spoil the cut. And now that that scrap won't hit the stabilizer on the way through, I'll make another shave on this cut to clean it up. And I definitely want to check a cut like this because the slightest deflection will spoil the cut. And I'm completely satisfied with the result. Now I'll mark and cut off this extra material here so that the flat end of the jam matches up with the long point of the longer of these two miters. And by rights, that cut will be right here, like a so. This cut could certainly be made easily on a miter box, but since I've got the whole setup going here, I'm just going to square up the blade and trim it up with the table saw. And that leaves me with a perfect fit when the back of this jam is lined up with the square end of that jam. I've got a perfect miter on the inside. Because of the zoom capability of the camera, you can see a little bit of a problem here. I bumped this corner while I was moving these parts around, and now look, my jam's all busticated. That looks like a real problem, doesn't it? And don't think that I did that on purpose for an opportunity to talk about Starbond glue. I didn't, but I'm going to use it as an opportunity anyways. A snap like that at this stage of the game could be kind of a dicey issue, but uh, I'll show you how quick and perfectly that can be repaired with CA glue. And I'll use Starbond CA glue to show you what I mean. For the best results, I like the workpiece to be rigid when I'm doing the repair so I don't have to worry about it shuffling around. And this is one of those times when a caddy for CA glue comes in quite handy. A lot of you saw the video where I made this caddy and talked about Starbond glue. There's a link to it here in case it's something you want to do after you see this. Because this piece is still hinging on a few wood fibers, it helps give me perfect alignment when I put the piece back into place. I'm going to use the medium CA glue and just doctor this up. It's probably going to break completely loose on me like that. That's all right. What I'm doing here is I'm deliberately getting everything covered with CA glue, both surfaces. I can wipe off this excess, but you can see the piece isn't sticking. But I'll give it a zap with the CA accelerator. And firm pressure instantly when that's set up. 
I got a little foaming on there because of the quantity of the glue and the amount of accelerator I got on it. But you can see that's not even 10 seconds and I've got a secure bond of that piece right back where it came from. And a few swipes with a sharp putty knife. And I've got a sturdy, flawless repair in no time at all. And unless your eyes are a whole lot better than mine, there's no way to tell where that little crack was. I really like the benefit of CA glue in the shop. I really like the Starbond products uh, because of the company's dedication to woodworkers and their needs and concerns. If you go to starbond.com and use special offer code NLC, it'll get you 15% off uh, a starter kit like this from Starbond and any other CA glue products that you care to have while you're shopping. With that little repair slash infomercial out of the way, I'm going to get to work on installing fasteners in these jam parts. The reason most jams aren't mitered like this is because a stepped rabbited connection with fasteners that go in at 90 degrees are a lot sturdier for the connection. A mitered connection like this tends to slip back and forth. When you drive a screw in one way, it can make the jam slip and misalign the corner. But as I already demonstrated with the SketchUp model of what a stepped jam would look like, I've got to use a mitered one here to make everything work out and get a mitered fit on this outside corner, which means I've got to work around the problem of these jams shifting uh, during assembly or installation. I'm doing two things to get that done. And the first involves a biscuit joiner. My biscuit joiner is this Elu thing. It's kind of an odd duck, but it's extremely useful. So whatever machine you're using, You'd need to set it up a different way, most likely, but uh, it's unplugged. And what I've done is I've marked the extreme places where the blade comes out of the table here or where it goes in and where it comes out. Uh, the blade cuts an arc in between those two points. So those points are important on where I place these biscuits. I want to place the biscuits down close to the shoulder of the miter. That'll be a decent distance there. And I found by testing that if I set my fence at about a quarter of an inch, that gives me a decent offset for the biscuit off the long point of the miter. As I said, everybody's biscuit joiner is going to be somewhat different than this. So you got to do what you got to do to locate the biscuits properly. I want to keep them spread apart as far as I can. So I want one biscuit to end right on this edge, but I don't want the other one cut any farther than this. So these are my extreme points for the back of one biscuit and the front of the other. And I've got the plunge depth set for number 20 biscuits. And the main tip here is to index the location of the biscuits off the long point of this 45 degree cut. You can't see it, but I can. I'm lining up the front pencil mark with this edge of the jam and then making the plunge. I'm wearing Smurf gloves so that I can hang on to that biscuit joiner because on this small surface it could be unstable and want to jump back. I've also got a nice sharp blade in there. And you can see that the end of that biscuit cut is right at this corner. Now I'll slide the cutter back and plunge to that pencil. That was a little scary when the piece moved in the vise. Note to self, secure that better next time. Anybody that's ever used a biscuit joiner notices the problem I'm about to have and that is the Biscuits are too long for the slots because the slots actually overlap in the middle, but that's not really a problem. I mark the point where the biscuit cuts come together, slide a biscuit in where it belongs, and notice how much the overlap is, and then just take a, take a pair of side cutters and trim it off. Maybe these are angle cutters and not side cutters. Regardless, now two biscuits fit perfectly in those slots. Earplugs, Smurf gloves, fire in the hole. Second verse, same as the first, I just flip the board around and make matching biscuit slots in the miter on the other end of the head jam. I suppose I might have gone down to number 10 biscuits for this and not have to trim them, but I like the extra depth that I'm getting out of these number 20 biscuits for a little deeper, stronger spline and connection. The top of the strike jam is the same setup as both ends of the head jam. So naturally, I do that next before changing the setup for the top of the hinge jam. And you gotta love it when the plan comes together. I'm not sure if it'll show up in the camera, but there's the slightest misalignment between this face and that face. The long point of the miter seems perfect. 
but something's a little off. Fortunately, when I drive the screws to secure this, it'll pull that together for a perfect alignment. I have to make an adjustment on the biscuit cutter fence because lining up on the long point here is not the same as lining up on this other jam because of that square end. For a proper fit, the long point of this miter lines up with the point where this miter breaks into a flat surface here. So I've just got to be a quarter inch down from there with the fence. It's an annoying little setup and adjustment, but it's not really all that difficult in practice. I'll just use this strip of melanin MDF to gauge that quarter inch and then reset the fence so that this face is right on that line. Now everything's tightened down, the fence index is here, and the cut is indexed off that pencil mark. Everything else is the same. And the most difficult part of this operation is not having a cameraman stand overhead with the camera. But with a little extra trouble for plunging these biscuits, it pays off in spades because it guarantees alignment during assembly and installation of the jam. There's a slight overlap of the miter here, and that's because I left four frog hairs on this edge to plane off and only planed off one. So this one's a little bit wider until I plane that surface down to match this one. That's an exact three quarters of an inch. And it's interesting that the inside of this jam miter actually fits better than the other one, even though it required a setup adjustment in the process. Don't know why, but I'll take it. And I dare say, this is starting to look an awful lot like a door jam. Go figure. And I hope that shows that uh, accurate millwork and careful um, placement of those biscuits is going to make this a very sturdy jam that will be accurate and easy to install. But the next step is going to be to install fasteners in these corners so that they stay aligned while I finish up assembly and installation. If you like this sort of in-depth masterclass on door building, I hope you'll subscribe to Next Level Carpentry if you haven't already. And while you're at it, please tap that thumbs up button or go ahead and hit it. Or if you're so motivated, just smash that sign. That way YouTube knows there's stuff going on here at Next Level Carpentry and I appreciate it. Now I'm going to quit screwing around and put some screws in these jams. This is an initial assembly of the jam. I just screwed a piece of scrap across the bottom that holds those legs the right distance apart. And I used a pipe clamp on this end. So this whole thing's th held together with that little strip on the end and this pipe clamp because there's biscuits in the corner. But obviously it's going to take more than that for the permanent assembly of this frame. But I think it's pretty cool how well those dry fit biscuits work for holding these jam sections together. Driving screws into an assembly like this is kind of like putting that thermometer in the turkey at Thanksgiving. You want to hit the spot with the most amount of meat. And for this jam, that's right in this area here. A screw driven into this area here has the most length to hold the connection together. And I'll drive the screws at a 45 degree angle so that the pieces are being pulled straight together instead of driving in, a, in at an angle like this that wants to force the pieces to slide. I'll drive another fastener in this area that will be driven straight in to the side jam and it'll actually go through one of the biscuits when it gets where it's going. And I could take a drill, just drill a pilot hole through here and it would probably be good enough. But because I can, I'm going to use a drill press to get the optimum angle and optimum strength out of the connection. I want the screws pretty close to that shoulder, so I'll just get them to end up about here in this line. I want it to miss that slot, so I'll put another screw here and another one about there. I can square these lines down to the sharp point of the miter like that. And this one squares around to the back face this way. So this is where the pilot screws go through and I'll stand it like this on the drill press so the holes come out at 90 degrees to that mitered face. And this is a bit of an awkward setup, especially with the camera in the way, but this is plenty accurate for what needs to happen here. That'll work good. 
Even using the drill press, those pilot holes wandered a little bit, probably because of the awkward angle I used for holding the piece. But that's why I wanted to use the drill press and not just freehand those with the drill because they might have wandered more and come out a finished surface. As it is, they're going to be fine. But I can just slip the biscuits back in place and slide the jam together. And as long as this miter is tight, when I drive those screws, they'll just hold it together nice and solid. I'm going to use this large snappy bit for chasing that pilot hole, driving a pilot hole into the jam leg, and then doing a countersink recess here all at the same time. I keep some of my snappy bits in this cool little 3D printed case. I got from viewer Russ Prince, who saw the snappy bits on a video and then immediately set about making a case. That's a pretty cool little deal, if I do say. So thanks, Russ. And these countersunk holes will look a little bit wonky because they're going in at a 45 degree angle. So they're deeper on one side than they need to be when they're in effective depth on the other side. But having a pilot hole in there for this bit to follow assures me of excellent alignment, which is really important at times like this when you pretty much have a one-shot deal to make everything work. I'm using these number nine GRK Torx drive construction screws for jam assembly. Uh, these are better than square drive screws in a lot of ways, uh, mainly because the steel is tougher and not as brittle. So they'll withstand more flex in that jam as it's being handled. And as long as I've got enough meat to hold the screw head and enough meat to hold the threads, that's one tight connection on that corner. And because I drilled all four of the pilot holes on the drill press at the same time, I can follow up with these first two screws in the other side of the jam as well. And don't panic about that countersink being so close to this edge, because remember, that's not a finished edge, and it gets hidden by the casing. And with those four construction screws in place, the jam is already sturdy enough to handle without the pipe clamp. I'm trapped! To hold the other edge of the jam together, I'll drive screws in from the side. The same turkey thermometer rule applies. I want to get as deep into the meat of that wood as I can. So a screw going here will do the job. And I want it to be as close to this edge as it can be, as long as it doesn't splinter out on the inside. I'm using shorter screws, so I'll use a shorter snappy. This is a smaller diameter also because the screw threads are going into end grain and I want a smaller pilot hole. Because these screws are going into end grain in that head jam, I'll shorten up the length of the pilot bit so that it drills a clearance hole through the side jam, but it doesn't oversize the pilot hole in the head jam. And this is the feature about snappy bits that first got me interested in using them. They've got a jumbo sized set screw for retaining the drill bit. That's an eighth of an inch or pretty close. And I've yet to strip out one of those screws while changing the bit length. And I can shorten that snappy again because I've got so little jam to go through but this will still keep it from splitting out. And I'm using the same type and size of screw for this side, except it's shorter. With those four biscuits and six torque screws, this jam is sturdy and will hold together for the long haul. And I end up with the 36 and 5 16 overall inside width that I wanted. That'll fit a door that's 36 inches with five 30 seconds gap on each side. I've got plenty of extra length in the jams to trim the bottoms off after a bit. And you can see how crooked this is. And that's because the floor is sloped for a trough drain and it drops an inch from one side of this door opening to the other. So I'm going to hold off trimming the bottom of these jams until I make that tapered uh, threshold to go across the bottom of this opening. And making that threshold will be part of episode number five. When I framed this wall, I was planning on just putting in a regular exterior style door jam. So there's 
There's an extra inch of width for shimming, but because I ended up deciding to go with concealed hinges and needing this extra jam thickness, my rough opening is actually too narrow. I could have taken the easy way out and just made my door slab narrower and narrowed up the jam, but I wanted a full 36 inch slab uh, to get in and out of the shop. So the fallback position is to unscrew the sheetrock and pull the cripple stud out of here. It's an inch and a half stud. I'll pull the inch and a half out and put a strip of one by four in there. And that'll give me the extra width on this jam opening to shim the jam into place when I install it. This is a non-structural wall and going with the three quarter inch cripple or trimmer is no deal at all. It's just a placeholder for screws that hold the jam in place. It's a little embarrassing, but I think it's worth it because those concealed hinges are so cool. And speaking of that, that's up next. Using and installing concealed hinges would be enough for two or three videos by itself. So I'm not going to go too deep into the weeds on this. To install these though, I want to make a template. I've got a video over here that goes deep into the weeds on making precision templates. And this is the exact sort of application that I made that video for. A detail about these uh, particular concealed hinges is that uh, the body for the part that goes into the door and the part that goes into the jam are slightly different in, uh, are slightly different in width by about a millimeter. So I've got to make two separate routing templates to get that done. I'm not going to jump right in and mortise those jams that I've spent so much time making. I'm going to do this all on a mock-up first. And so I just took a chunk of scrap and I made a piece that's an inch and three quarters thick. This is the thickness of the door. So I can use that to make, fit, and try the template for the part of the hinge that goes into the door. And then I'll do the same thing to make a template that goes into the jam. Uh, the jam part is complicated because the mortise goes down here, but the step in the jam is going to mean that I use uh, this as an indexing surface for routing that. It gets a little tricky and I'll show you the fixture, but not a whole lot about how it's made because that's so specific to this job and this hinge. The upshot of making this template though is to start off by making a rip that's precisely the width of the part of the hinge that goes into the edge of the door. And I've made this out of a piece of half inch MDF, which is the material I'm going to use for the whole template. And this will play out like an extended Starbond commercial, but it'll also help you see why I love CA glue in the shop. Just spray activator on this edge of this piece. And then I'll use medium CA glue on the edge of this piece here. Pretty good bead because this stuff is so porous. Then I just drop the piece down and stick it there. As long as it's flush on top, that's all that matters at this point. Then I go ahead and add CA glue to this other hinge width block. And this is the part of the hinge that goes into the door. So I'm just going to set it down here like this. Drop this block down and slide this all together like that. The important part is to get a tight fit on the ends of this hinge kind of cold in the shop and this glue is setting up a little slower than normal, but that got it there. Because this piece is the width of the hinge and I glued it on the length of the hinge, I know that this rectangular opening is a perfect template for routing in this part of the hinge. So I'll just glue this other side on. And once that's set up, I know I'm golden with a template for this hinge. I don't have to radius the corners because the pattern bit that I use for routing the mortise will leave that radius at each corner. And that greatly simplifies the template making process. And the way these hinges get installed, they're not centered up in the door, but they're four millimeters from the face of the door. So I just need to get this template to line up like that on the edge of the door. So I'll put a little guide fence four millimeters from one edge of this opening. And I'm sure it'll cause an uproar when people learn that Next Level Carpentry actually used metric measurements, but I'm putting a mark in from the edge four millimeters, which will be the mark for the index fence that holds this jig the right distance in from the edge. 
And this is just one way of getting this accomplished. But I'm just gonna raise the saw blade up to that mark and then cut about a 16th of an inch of the face of the underside of this template away, which will give me a perfect edge guide for gluing up this guide fence on the bottom of the template. And you can see how that little edge guide makes it super easy to glue and screw a piece of pine on here to act as an edge fence that will index the template to the door edge, even if it works a little too good sometimes. And by drilling those pilot holes through from the backside first, I can countersink them and drive screws to the front exactly where they need to go without measuring. And now the fence indexes to the face of the door, lines up this mortise precisely when I clamp it up and down on the door where I want it to be. And this is what the mortise in the door edge sample looks like when using the routing template. The steps in the mortise match the steps in the back of the hinge, and it fits nice and snug in the mortise. Because of the step in the jam where the mortise goes, a half inch thick material isn't enough to get flush with this upper face. So I added quarter inch MDF to flush this out at three quarters. It would have been simpler just to use sheet goods that were three quarters of an inch thick, but I didn't have anything that was the right height exactly, and I would have had to add something to it anyways. So I just cut strips of quarter inch at the same time I was cutting the half inch. And it's easy enough to tack them in place. And I use tacks instead of CA glue because I want the two laminations of the template to be tight to each other for consistent thickness. Adding that quarter inch material makes the template flush with the step in the jam so the router rides smooth while making the mortise. Unlike the template for routing the edge of the door, this part for routing the jam has a wide face and a thin edge, and that thin edge spaces the hinge off the step in the jam and gives clearance for the weather strip when the door is installed. This is the leaf of the hinge that gets mortised into the thick edge of my pellet wood door jam. To set router bit depths for the stepped mortise, I just lay the hinge on top of my mock-up and scribe out the depths for the shoulder and the deep pocket of this mortise. Because of its handy size, I'm using my Bosch Colt router for routing these mortises. I've put in a quarter inch shank, top bearing pattern bit. It's a half inch cut diameter and a half inch cut length. Because of the step in the jam, I've got to get an extra three quarter of an inch projection out of this router bit to reach the bottom of the mortise. So I've got it chucked up uncomfortably shallow in the router collet. But as long as I take light passes and use a steady feed rate, it'll be fine. I'll refer back to these depth reference lines each time I set the bit. And I'll make the first pass at about an eighth of an inch to get the mortise process started. In a bit more of that wrinkly, I mean irony, that I mentioned earlier, I had to do some research and experimenting to be able to route the mortise for these hinges in this jam without messing it up. I wanted to go to YouTube for ideas, but unfortunately, there's nothing there for this, yet at least. But I'm gonna put my patient on the operating table saw for this procedure. I don't remember if I mentioned it, but the distance from the top of the template to the mortise for the door is four inches. And that places the mortise the right distance down from the top of the door. To achieve an eighth inch gap at the top of the door, I made the template for the jam at four and one eighth inches. So when the template's in place, properly places the mortise without extra measuring. To work through the morticing process and how I was gonna film it, I did the mortise near the top of the jam first to debug it for shooting this section of the video. The specifications and instructions for these hinges are so complex, they might as well be written in Japanese. Oh wait, that is Japanese. There is an English translation, but it's still pretty technical to follow and comprehend what it's showing. But the upshot of most of that is the most important feature of these hinges, which is what I call the throw. It's the distance in between the leaves when the hinges are open. And with this hinge installed, you can see there's not even two millimeters of space in between the hinge leaf and the face of that jam. And this is why I took extra steps to reduce the width of the jam here by an eighth of an inch in the design. If you notice the difference in thickness between that space and the thickness of this thin strip of wood on the edge of the door, you'll notice that the strip is wider than the space. 
And what that means is that I'm not going to be able to get a 180 degree opening swing on this particular door and jam, which is the biggest drawback to this jam design. The hinges simply don't have enough throw to clear the extended jam that accepts my integral casing. With the tolerances that I've built in here, the door will open 110 degrees, which is plenty for this particular installation, and that's about typical for a cabinet door installation. If this door was going to be installed in the middle of the wall and not near a corner, I would have needed to use typical barrel hinges because they have more throw in between the face of the jam and the face of the door when it's open to 180 degrees, which is always necessary for clearing door casing, etc. The rule of thumb placement for door hinges in carpentry is 7 inches down from the top and 11 inches up from the bottom. So I'm 7 inches down this knuckle of the hinge. I go 6 foot 8 and an eighth to the bottom of the door for a 6 foot 8 door and an eighth inch space. From the mark at the bottom of the door, I measure up 8 inches, which will leave that knuckle of the hinge 3 inches higher or 11 inches for the placement of this lower hinge. And this hinge spacing is kind of old school. And the hinges get placed in various spots depending on who's hanging the door. The theory is though that the majority of the weight for any hanging door is on the top hinge. The closer the top hinge is to the top of the door, the more strength it gives it. The hinge on the bottom of the door can be higher up so it's not so near the floor. But variance within a few inches is pretty typical. But this three inch mark is where I set the template. The spacing from the stop is set by the thickness of this part of the template. And I really like how it takes special measuring at this point out of the equation. I clamp the template in place using these small Irwin bar clamps because of their ability to hold firm and positive. And there's enough space between the mortise and that clamp for the router base to clear to make a nice clean mortise. Because of the volume of material that needs to be removed from this mortise, and the extreme extension of the router bit. I want to minimize the amount of stress that this router bit is taking. So I'm going to pre-mark the mortise in the hole along with the steps for the deeper part of the mortise. And transfer those marks down inside the template. And then I'll use an inch and a sixteenth Forstner bit to remove a bunch of this material ahead of time so the router has less work to do. I can mark the depth of the shallow step in the mortise as well as the depth of the deep one and use that as a rough gauge when I'm drilling these holes. I'll make them well within the edges of the mortise and I'll stop short of the depth so that the router makes the final pass nice and clean. With the shallow pilot tip, these Forstner bits aren't really designed for use in a hand drill. But if I'm careful and keep the drill going straight, I can easily remove this material without issue. What I don't want to do is tip the drill when I'm starting it to disengage that point because the bit will take off and wreck the door jam outside the mortise. And the beauty of Forstner bits is they drill a nice flat bottom hole and the holes can overlap. So I'm able to drill out probably 90% of the material that needs to be removed for this mortise and relieve stress for that dicey router bit projection. I use compressed air a lot in the shop for stuff like clearing out these wood chips. For years in the old shop, I just coiled the hose up next to the wall. You probably remember that from my last shop. But I got this great DeWalt air hose reel for this shop, and I'm really liking it. The hose deploys and returns easily. Plus, the whole unit swivels back and forth, depending on where I'm working in the shop. And the best thing about it is the hose is up near the ceiling off the floor and keeps wall space uncluttered. I've got the pressure regulator and disconnect hardware up there near the ceiling, too. I can easily remove the hose reel from its bracket if I need to take it somewhere, and a quick disconnect fitting on the hose allows that to happen in seconds. And now everything's ready to clamp the template in place and make the first pass for this mortise with that little flush trim bit. I know from experience, and particularly from my experience routing the first mortise in this jam, that shallow passes are better. But it's hard to be patient and take it in three steps instead of one full-on macho pass to get the whole thing done at once. As with any template work, 
It's important to start with the bit spinning free so that it doesn't catch and jump into the workpiece and the template. But this first pass is just about an eighth of an inch. And you can barely see what's being routed out. But the important thing is it's nice and smooth and clean. I drop the bit down about another eighth of an inch, double check it with my depth setting marks and take a second pass. I make one final depth setting adjustment, check it with the depth mark and clean up the shallow shoulders of this mortise with the third pass. And those three passes make that shoulder for this upper leaf of the hinge nice, smooth and clean. Now I need to switch to a longer router bit to get uh, the deeper section of the mortise routed. And because the deep section isn't as long as the upper section, I need to change the template. Rather than make a new template with a shorter hole, I just make these modifier blocks that slide down in the mortise like that so that the guide bearing on the bit stops on those blocks and it makes the deep part of that mortise big enough for this to slide down in. I made similar blocks for the door edge routing template and this way I can stay with only two templates instead of needing to make four. I switched to another quarter inch shank bit. This is quarter inch shank, half inch diameter, one inch cut length and that allows me to reach way down into the bottom of that mortise. The bit is um, secured uncomfortably shallow in the router collet, but because I made the relief holes with the drills, I'll take light passes and a slow steady feed rate and get the job done. If that mortise needed to be a quarter inch deeper, I'd have to go to plan B, and I'm not quite sure what that is. I might have to resort to something old school like a mallet and a chisel. But I've reset the depth to take a pass about an eighth of an inch deep on this deep section of the mortise. I've got the router maxed out for speed to help minimize chatter and keep the cut clean and smooth. And notice that I make a fair amount of this cut by climb cutting. I'm going backwards with the feed on the router, which helps keep the cut smooth by keeping the router bit from digging in in the normal feed direction. I've got to hang on to the router to make sure it doesn't take off in the work, but with a light shallow pass and a high speed, that's simpler to do. And I'm getting a nice clean mortise down there by paying attention to those details. I drop the bit down another eighth inch or so and take a second cautious pass. Rinse, lather, repeat. Drop the bit, take another cautious pass. I make my final bit depth adjustment to the lower line on the pattern. And I'm keeping in mind that the router bit is going to engage the bottom of the mortise at this point because the holes aren't drilled to full depth. So when I turn on the router, I've got to keep it off that bottom surface and then plunge it in to establish that final depth. So I was a little bit tricky because if I don't do it smoothly, the bit could catch and throw the router into the template, snap the bit, or spoil the piece. You can see the step that I'm talking about here, and you notice the way I pivoted the router down into the work. I'm going climb cutting to clean that out as much as possible, and then I'll make a final cleanup pass going the correct direction to smooth everything up when I'm done. And you can hear the chatter that I'm getting with this setup because the bit is running so far out of the collet, and I'm making an aggressive cut, all this on a quarter inch shank router. With all that vibration, I want to keep an eye on the Sharpie mark I put on the shank of the bit because if your collet is less than perfect, the cheddar will cause the bit to wander out of the chuck and can spoil the workpiece when it routes too deep. With extreme router bit settings like this, I've got to be extra cautious because that's the time when it's most likely to happen. And that, my friends, is exactly what I'm after. I love it when a process goes this smoothly, but it doesn't always happen that way. And if you want a little entertainment, stick around to the very end of the video. With those hinge mortises made, all the difficult parts of this jam are taken care of. So I'm going to wrap up episode four here and making a threshold and installing the jam will have to wait for the next episode. Even when I try to keep episodes short, they tend to run pretty long because there's just so much stuff I want to pack into these videos for you guys. I've still got a lot of figuring out to do on the episode format because I'm trying to shoot for a video of 30 minutes or less to keep things concise. But as you know, that's kind of a challenge for me. This has been a busy week. This whole pile of wood here, this is all alder. And that is a client project. It's a modern three panel 
door that gets made out of that alder. The unique thing about it is that the inside of the door has to be clear alder to match existing woodwork and the outside is going to be knotty alder for a mountain rustic look uh, that the client is after. So that's a fun project and hopefully in time I can shoot video on builds like that. And everybody that joins this growing list of patrons helps bring the reality forward for Next Level Carpentry where I can devote more of my time to videos here because it offsets income I'm not making on my day job. As it is, I'm doing this project at night, shooting and building video, and during the day I'm working on this door project. It's a great project, there's a lot of stuff going on there, but I physically don't have time to do video on all of that. So I appreciate everyone that's joining Patron and that's sharing videos here at Next Level Carpentry with friends and acquaintances that are interested in woodwork. It's been kind of a kick doing the live premiere thing. I hope I can get this video done that way. That's my intent. But if I'm going to do that, I better cut this off and get to work editing. So for now, as always, thanks for watching. And only viewers that watch this video until the bitter end get to see this embarrassing little sequence. In my frustration over the issue with the router template getting wallowed out and repairing that, I routed the whole mortise down past the depth of this shoulder instead of doing the step sequence that you saw in the video. And so what you actually saw me routing in the video was this little filler piece that I made to fit down in here so that I get the right depth of shoulders to accommodate this hinge. So a little bit of Starbond CA glue to hold in this cleverly shaped shim solves the problem completely. Thanks for watching to the end.